So on that note, um, we are going to move on to our keynote speaker, uh, which is Paul Jones this year. He is a uh, internationally recognized PHP expert. I've, I have gleaned so much knowledge in working with PHP from Paul. Uh, I live not far from Paul, and so I'll often pick his brain on things when we're at uh, uh, meetups and that sort of thing. Uh, so please give a warm welcome to Paul Jones. How many people, ooh, that's loud, man. <laughs> Normally I don't speak with a microphone. My father was a preacher and so I learned how to project. I'm gonna try and hold back with that. Uh, coming up right, very good. All right, so today we're gonna be talking about how the same thing happens every time. Uh, mythology, movies, and management. Uh, a little bit about me before we get started again. My name is Paul Jones. In a previous career, I used to get paid to be a spy. I spent eight years in Air Force intelligence. I know everyone is now thinking about their favorite military intelligence joke. Keep it to yourself. I've heard it. <laughs> but both before then and after that, I've been a programmer both by temperament and by profession. I started programming in BASIC in 1983. Who here remembers the TI-99 4A computer? Gen Xers, right there. Here we all are. Uh, but I've been programming in PHP almost exclusively since 1999. Those two numbers put together, if I've been programming since 1983 and you were born after 1983, I've been doing this longer than you've been alive, that makes me a very old man in this profession. We'll come back to more about that in a little while. But in that time, I've been everything from a junior developer to a VP of engineering. If you've used Zen Framework, I was an original con contributor to that. Uh, Aura Relay, the Aura Project, the Radar Framework, the Atlas ORM. Uh, I've done a lot of community work, the Framework Interoperability Group, if anyone is familiar with that. I'm a, f a founding member of that, the PSR1 and PSR2 coding standards. I shepherded through the acceptance process, the PSR4 autoloading standard, I'm the person behind that. Uh, all of those things led to me writing, uh, in, other, in more ways than one, modernizing legacy applications in PHP, that's probably the thing I'm most well known for these days. And in writing that, I discovered a pattern called Action Domain Responder. I'll be happy to talk about any of those things uh, afterwards if you, think of any of the, if you think any of that applies to you. What we're gonna be talking about today though is not any of that specifically, but more about patterns. Patterns that we find in our lives, patterns that we find in our entertainment. Of course, when we think about patterns as programmers, the first thing that we think about is not patterns in any other places. We think about patterns in software. Who here has read either of these books, either Design Patterns or, or the Fowler book? A few folks. I strongly recommend, as developers, that you read both of these at one point or at some point in your life. The first one is called Design Patterns. It tells you, uh, it gives you names for patterns that keep showing up in software over and over again. Things like the facade, the proxy, the builder pattern, things like that. There's also patterns of enterprise ap application architecture. This is where we find the terminology of model view controller, table data gateway, active record, things like that. The great things, as a side note, the great thing about these books is when you read them, they will not tell you how to do things that you're already doing. What they will do is they will give you a vocabulary to express what it is that you are already doing. So if you wanted to, you could say, well, this class that I've written here, all it does is move data back and forth from the table. Each class represents one table and there's no logic associated with it. You could say that, or you could say this class is a table data gateway. That is the power of these books. It gives us, a, gives us a vocabulary to communicate with. But it turns out there are other patterns all around us, all the time, that we may not necessarily recognize. Patterns in our entertainment, and from our, in our entertainment ends up being based on mythology in a lot of ways. In fact, if we go back to the 40s, we discover this man named Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell looked at all of human mythology, specifically the, the hero stories, and he discovered that whether it's European mythology, North American mythology, South American, Indian, Japanese, Chinese, whatever it is, these hero stories all follow the same pattern. There is always, the hero always has some form of auspicious birth. The hero is then presented with a call to adventure that the hero always, almost always refuses when he's first presented with it. And then through circumstance conspiring against him is thrust into the adventure. 
he has to pass through what Campbell calls the first veil into the world of the adventure. And in the world of the adventure, he meets the same people every time. He, meet, he has the same experiences every time. And at the end of it, he comes back to the world that he started from to deliver new knowledge to that world to help both himself and the people that he came from. I was first introduced to this through The Power of Myth. It's an interview with Joseph Campbell by Bill Moyers. It's an audio interview. It is fantastic. But if you feel like, oh, okay, right on. Who, who do you, so how do you, do, have you heard this one yourself? Yeah, um, there's a guy in Pittsburgh, uh, Michael Murbosch, who's a big, uh, he's the one who introduced me to Joseph Campbell. Excellent. You're not allowed to answer any questions during this. <laughs> Let everyone else have the joy of discovery here. But if you want to, read The Hero with a Thousand Faces. It's a fantastic piece of work. It's a little dry. The Moyer, the Moyer stuff is a much better introduction. The point here being that we don't think of patterns in our life. We think of patterns of software. And what I want to try to do today is convince you not only that these patterns exist in the entertainment that we consume, but also in our work life. And that will be the second half of the discussion. I do want to point out, though, that as we go through this, that what we're talking about today is not science, it is more like art. If you've read Rutherford, if you know anything about Rutherford, or if you've read any Heinlein, they will both tell you that there is only one science. It is called physics, and everything else is stamp collecting. What this means is that physics provides you some sort of predictive capacity. The things we're gonna talk about today are not predictively true, but they are observationally true. So the things that we're going to talk about today, you'll be able to observe in the world, and even if they don't give you predictive capacity, they will give you some ability to recognize things when they are happening. So we're going to start out by talking about patterns in movies. And in doing so, we're going to talk about the Star We're going to talk about Star Wars, The Princess Bride, The Matrix, Superman, Star Trek, Tron, the Tron from 1982, the real Tron. The Hunger Games, Harry Potter, and The Last Airbender. Now, I do not mean The Last Airbender movie. The movie is horrifyingly bad. Avoid it. <laughs> but the TV series, three seasons, some of the best television storytelling you're ever going to see. I strongly recommend, if you get the chance, go get it on DVD, subscribe to it digitally, whatever it is. Chain smoke the thing over three weekends. You will be rewarded. But I also have to warn you on this. There will be spoilers here for these movies. So if you have not seen these movies, this is your chance to you know, put on your headphones or walk out. Although if you have not seen these movies, your nerd credentials are suspect. <laughs> you may wish to pick a different profession. So what we're gonna do first is, we're not gonna talk about Campbell directly. What we're gonna do is talk about a pattern that you will see in these through pictures. And when you see the pattern, what I want you to do is just call it out. Don't raise your hand, you know, just to say it loud enough for everyone to hear it. If you have seen this already, or if you already know this, hold back, let other people have the joy of discovery here. So let's look at some pictures from movies. Again, when you see the pattern, just yell it out. Here we have Luke and Han and Leia. Wesley and Ego and Buttercup. Tron, Flynn, and Yori. Morpheus, Neo, and Trinity. Are we seeing it yet? Two men and one woman. Two men and a woman. Two guys and a girl. Harry Potter, same thing. Ron, Hermione, and Harry. Ong, Soka, and Katara. Same thing. Star Trek. Same thing. The Hunger Games. Oh, God. <laughs> team Vampire, Team Wolf, and Team Sleepy. When my, when my wife saw this, when I was practicing this, my wife saw this slide, and she's like, ah, are you gonna talk about Twilight? Nope, no I'm not. <laughs> and the point is there's two guys and a girl, depending on your politics, it's a strong independent woman and two dude bros. The point is, this, now that you've seen this, you're gonna see this in every movie you watch, especially if it is a dramatic or a heroic story. And again, this is not strictly from, from Joseph Campbell, but it is very common in modern hero and heroine stories. And you're gonna see it all the time, now that I've pointed it out. So let's get back to Joseph Campbell a little more directly. Joseph Campbell talks about the hero, or the heroine. The hero or the heroine always has some form of parent trouble. And when I say parent trouble, I do not mean that they cannot get the, cars for the, key, get the, get the keys for the car on the weekend. 
I do not mean that their allowance is not big enough. I mean that the parents are not there at all. The hero is almost always an orphan. One or both parents are dead. Ong, the last airbender. When we first meet him, he's been in suspended animation for 100 years. His entire nation has been destroyed. He wakes up completely alone and has nobody to help him. Superman, not just has, has his nation been destroyed, his entire planet is gone. Parents are dead, whole families, everyone is gone. Comes to Earth, and he has no relationship with his parents at all unless you count a hologram. It's kind of hard to have a relationship with a hologram. Katniss Everdeen, father dead right off the bat, died in a coal mine collapse before the story begins. Jim Kirk, father died to save him, orphan. Harry Potter, his parents were killed by, well, you know who. <laughs> living with his aunt and his uncle. Luke Skywalker, living with his aunt and uncle. And his father is, well, let's just say it's complicated. This slide doesn't exactly fit, but was too good not to leave out, not to leave in. <laughs> you don't quit fighting, I'm gonna call your parents. Oh, right. So the point of this is, remember, we're talking about mythology. Mythology is not just stories and entertainment. Mythology is there to help you make sense of the world that you are in, to help, make, help you make sense of your own life. And when we discover that the hero or the heroine is an orphan, that they are alone in the world, think about your own life. Everybody here has felt in some point in their life that they were alone in the world, that they had some special burden that no one else could carry. There was nothing they could do to work it out, that they were stuck with it themselves. And if only there was some way to figure out how to get through this problem that I have, mythology tells us that there is a way, that there are people ready to help us, if only we know how to recognize them, that there are experiences that we are going to have that are gonna help us with this, if only we know what they look like. This is the purpose of mythology now, so that we can figure out that we are not alone in the world and help us get through whatever it is that we need to get through. One of the people that Campbell tells us that we meet through mythology is someone that Campbell calls the old man as mentor. The old man as mentor used to be a hero on his own. When he was younger, he was a badass. He was a hero in his own day. But now he is old, he has acquired wisdom, he has come back from his adventures, and his purpose now is to help the hero in this story figure out how to make sense of his or her life and go on to their achievements. The classic example here is Obi-Wan Kenobi. Obi-Wan Kenobi of the Clone Wars. Used to be a badass, he was great, but now he's old. Where is, he when, where is Kenobi when we first meet him? He's living in a cave on a desert planet as far away from society as he can get. What's the first thing he does when he reintroduces himself to society? Sneaks into town, past the cops, goes to a bar, kills a couple of people, and escapes on a pirate ship. The man is a badass. <laughs> Albus Dumbledore, greatest wizard of his age. What is he doing when we first meet him? School principal. Kind of boring. But his time for greatness is coming around again. Morpheus, greatest fighter in the Matrix of the terrorist organization against the agents, the only man so far as we know to go up against an agent and live. Hamish Abernathy, survivor of the games. You are not a survivor of the games by being a shrinking wallflower. The man is a badass. Now again, I know this says old man as mentor, and in the books he is relatively young, but in that world, even being 30 makes you an old man. Christopher Pike of Starfleet gives Jim Kirk his challenge to become a Starfleet, to go to Starfleet in the first place and then become a captain. In charge of starships, these massive, these massive uh, uh, ships of destructive ability, the man is a badass. Uncle Iroh from The Last Airbender. When we first, who here has actually seen Airbender? A few people. When we first meet Iroh, he seems like a doddering old man. All he wants to do is drink his tea and play Mahjong. But through the course of the series, we learn he's not just Uncle Iroh, he is General Iroh. And by the end, we learn why they called him the Dragon of the West. 
the man is a badass. But the people who have seen this are wondering right now, wait a minute, how can he be the old man as mentor? He's supposed to be mentoring the hero. He's of the Fire Nation. He's one of the bad guys. This just proves what genius the last airbender is. You get not one hero story in Airbender, you get two. It is the story of Ong, the last airbender, and it's also the story of Prince Zuko of the Fire Nation. He mentors both of them. Again, highly recommended series to watch. So there's the hero, there's the old man as mentor. One of the experiences that these two people end up having is something that Campbell calls the gift of magical assistance. And I have magical in parentheses here because sometimes the gift is a technical gift, but as Arthur C. Clarke tells us, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So technology counts as magic for this discussion. The classic example here is when Ben Kenobi meets Luke Skywalker for the first time. What happens? Luke gets his father's lightsaber, a weapon. And Ben Kenobi starts teaching him the power of the Force, the ability to manipulate the world, the power of your mind. What happens when Harry Potter goes to the wizarding world? First thing he gets is a wand. I want you to look carefully at that. That is a lightsaber. It is a transmission device for magic, but that magic is, a way, is also a way you can be used as a weapon. So that wand is a weapon. It is just like a lightsaber. And Harry begins to learn how to use magic. The power, to, the ability to manipulate the world with the power of your mind. Same thing is happening here. What happens when uh, Neo unplugs from the Matrix and plugs himself back in again? First thing that Morpheus teaches him is Kung Fu fighting, how to be a weapon. And he learns how to manipulate the matrix, that is, to manipulate the world with the power of his mind. Same things keep happening here. Katniss Everdeen, her gift of magical assistance, gifts literally rain down from heaven on her. It doesn't get, I mean, that's pretty magical, man. Wesley gets killed, he gets dead, well, he gets mostly dead. Gift of magical assistance here, Max resurrects him, brings him back from the dead. It doesn't get much better than that unless you are Jim Kirk, in which case you get a starship. Now, I want you to think about how he gets his starship. He's, he goes to Starfleet essentially on a bet. He then cheats on his final exam. He, gets, he stows away on the starship essentially as third lieutenant supernumerary. Through pure chance, he is placed in the chain of command, and then with a little bit of bravado, everyone, he managed to, managed to get to sit in the captain's seat to be in charge of this starship, which is itself a weapon. That is magical assistance. So we've talked about the, the hero or the heroine, the, the, uh, the old man, there's this, there's this gift that he gets. But there are other people that are involved here. There's someone that I will call the big strong helper, or the big hairy helper. The big, the, this helper is, again, big, Strong, maybe not too smart, but his heart is always in the right place. Always well-intentioned. Hagrid is a classic example here. Fezzik from The Princess Bride. Well-intentioned. He's nice. He's kind of one of the bad guys, but, you know, maybe we can just put down our weapons and try to kill each other like civilized men. Chewbacca. Big hairy helper. Big, strong, heart in the right place. What's interesting about the, this person is that they're you, sometimes... They are the mechanic on the magical flying transportation. Sometimes they are the magical flying transportation, as with Appa in The Last Airbender. So these are our heroes, the hero's party, but they are not the only people in the world. There is some force against which they are fighting. There is some antagonist involved. This is the evil ruler and their chief enforcer. The classic example is here is Emperor, is Emperor Palpatine and Darth Vader. Evil ruler and chief enforcer. President Snow and Seneca Crane. Seneca Crane, the person in charge of the games designed to kill all the players. From Tron, we have the master control program in Sark. Sark, the person in charge of the games designed to kill all the players. And of course, Prince Humperdinck and Count Rugen. Humperdinck is about to become the evil ruler in any case. What's fun about this, and I didn't notice this until I put together the slides, is that the chief enforcer, 
always seems to have some form of disfigurement or deformity, or wears a mask, sometimes both. Count Rugen, what's his dis deformity? Six fingers on the right hand. I know someone who's looking for you. Oh, let's back up. With Sark, he's kind of wearing a mask, it's a headdress. By the end, he gets disfigured, he gets a disc thrown through his face. Senka Crane, look at that beard and tell me that's not a mask. <laughs> of course, the classic example, Darth Vader, disfigured and masked. So we see these same characters every time. Campbell talks about them in the myth. We've talked about them here in movies, specifically in hero or heroine stories. And right now, some people are thinking, well, let me get this right. If you're saying that all it takes to recognize a hero story is to see that there's two guys and a girl, an old man as a mentor, a big hairy helper, and an evil ruler and an enforcer, well, in hell, doesn't that mean the Dukes of Hazard is a hero story? <laughs> and yet, if you look at it, it fits. Bo and Luke do. Daisy. Uncle Jesse, Uncle Jesse, the old man as mentor, sure, uh, Boss Hogg, Sheriff Coltrane, the ruler enforcer. The thing is, you know that it has to be a hero story. It has to be. Because Cooter, the big hairy helper, is the mechanic on the magical flying transportation. <laughs> so again, you've seen it. You can't unsee it now. This is the bare basic introduction to Campbell. And I hope that this impresses upon the idea that you've been seeing this your whole life and you never noticed it. It's been there the whole time. So now that you've seen it, you've observed it, again, remember this is observationally true. It's not necessarily predictively true. We talk about these patterns. They may not all be there all the time, but most of them are there most of the time. And I tell you this not to ruin your enjoyment of these movies, or to ruin your enjoyment of this entertainment, but to give you the ability to delight in the joy of discovery and recognition, and to appreciate the small differences between the stories and what they bring to the story outside of the basic pattern. It'll also help you make sense of stories that you may not have liked in the first place. Has anyone here seen Pootie Tang? Who is gonna admit it? Okay, yeah. This is a terrible movie, it's awful. Until you realize that it fits this pattern. And then it is just so much fun. I mean, you see him here with this belt. It is his father's belt. He uses it as a weapon. It's the same thing over and over again. Not only will it help you make sense of these stories, but when you know what to look for, you'll learn to recognize these people and these experiences in your own life. And that will end up helping you out if you know what to look for. So hopefully at this point I have convinced you that these kinds of patterns do exist in the wider world. You've just never noticed them before. We're now going to move on to things that we see may or may not recognize at work. Some patterns that are there if only you know what to look for. Now it would be too easy to say that there's your team lead, there's your development, there's your DevOps, and there's all your servers. You know, that, we're not doing that. That would be much too simple. We are going to talk about some personalities and some... Uh, organizational structures that we run into over and over again. The first thing I'm gonna talk about is developer temperament. It took me a long time to come up with names for these. I've gone through several variations of these names. I have settled on what I will call the priest aspect and the merchant aspect of developer temperament. The priest we could call maybe the, the academic or the architect or astronaut, depending on how derogatory we wanna be about it. When you ask the developer who fits this archetype, when you ask them, what is good code? The answer you're going to get back, depending on you know, the, the paradigm that they, that they subscribe to, is gonna be, it needs to be good object-oriented code. It needs to fit the solid principles. It needs to be, have good separation of concerns. Abstraction, tests, tests. Who here is actually writing unit tests? Uh, right on. The priest archetype, focuses on peer approval when they're making decisions about how they write their code. That is, when I show this program, when I show this code to another developer, what are they going to say about it? Are they gonna say that it adheres to this dogma or are they gonna find fault with it because it does not adhere to this dogma? They're very program oriented. That is, they have an interior view of the code. They're interested in the code for itself as a work in and of itself. They tend to have a longer-term time, longer time horizon when making decisions about how to write code 
They are thinking about longer term maintenance. They are thinking about the ability of others to understand what it is they have done so that they don't have to sit there and explain what has happened all the time. But there is a drawback to working, to seeing the world this way. There is a very strong tendency to engage in what, it, what it's called in other contexts, a holiness spiral or a purity spiral. Because I guarantee every line of code that you write, no matter how perfect it is, someone else will come along and say, it's not perfect enough. You could do something else to make it more perfect. And so you spiral, and then someone comes in after that and says the same thing, and someone else comes in after that and says the same thing too. So you're all spiraling in on each other to make it more OOP, to make it more solid. So that's the priest. Another aspect, though, is something that I'm calling the merchant. When you ask the merchant, what is good code? The merchant says, good code is code that makes me money. The sooner the better. I don't care what it looks like. If it's getting me cash, that is good code. Now, I want to point out here that neither the priest nor the merchant is either good or bad. The priest is totally fine. The merchant is totally fine. These are two different ways of looking at the world that are equally valid. Good code makes me money. Their focus is not on other programmers. They're not seeking their approval. They're seeking customer approval. Because it's the customers that give me the money, I want their approval. And all the code that I write must therefore be focused on how well it works as a product, not as a work in itself. So they have an exterior view on the programs that they are writing. They're thinking about it from the outside, not from the inside. And they tend to have a shorter term time horizon. Why? Because we need this feature now. Because that gets us revenue now. But the merchant has a drawback too. You go for that, you work that way long enough, you end up in a technical debt deadlock. The idea here being that after a while the code becomes so bad, it's impossible to modify without huge amounts of effort. So the next feature you add that might have taken only three days, now it takes three weeks or longer, or you have to scrap the thing and start over again. I may have mentioned I have a book about this kind of situation called Modernizing Legacy Applications in PHP. The point here is that the, neither of these is good or bad, and both of them call themselves practical. Well, I just need to be we just need to be practical about this decision. Well, as Ayn Rand tells us, what is practical depends on what it is you want to practice. So if you're having an argument as a merchant with a priest, and you're saying, I'm just trying to be practical, they're saying exactly the same thing about you. We need to be practical too. The only practical thing is to make it long-term maintainable. No, no, the only thing that's practical is to get the feature out so they make our money. Not the point, these things exist in a tension against each other. They have to, because if all you do is write purity holiness code, Nothing gets shipped and you make no money. But if all you do is deliver features as fast as you can, eventually everything grinds to a halt. So the point of this is not to say, again, that the priest is better than the merchant or vice versa. It is to recognize, first of all, that these exist in a tension, that, they exist in, that both of them exist in each of us, and that when, dis when talking with someone else, we need to figure out for ourselves, where am I on these two aspects? Which of these two do I emphasize in myself? And which of these two does the other person emphasize in themselves? And in doing so, be able to strike a good set of trade-offs in how you're going to deliver the product and at the same time make the program of the product maintainable. Does everyone get what I'm saying there? There's also a personality that I call the problem child. I call them problem child because my French is terrible. Enfant terrible. The thing about the problem child is this. This is a person you're going to run into as a developer who is super intelligent, really competent, highly talented, knows everything. Or at least they'll tell you they know everything. They're also rationally overconfident about their ability to perform. And it is because of these characteristics that they have, tend to have very low empathy for other people who are not as talented, as competent, as knowledgeable, and who do not have that same irrational overconfidence. The thing about problem child is that because he or she has always done so well, or at least they think they have always done so well, they remember every single success they've ever had. But every miss, every failure is always somehow due to someone else. 
The boss didn't let me do that. The policy was something else. I wasn't told the right, I wasn't given the right instructions. It's always someone else's fault. And so in their own mind, they have never really failed at anything they've set their mind to. Problem child also has something that is called student syndrome. And we all know what student syndrome is. When you were in high school and you had a paper you had to write and you had two weeks to write it and it, would be, it was gonna be due on Friday, when did you begin writing the paper? Thursday. <laughs> Problem child is the same thing, but he does it on your time with the code that you need. If you give him a delivery date, he'll deliver it. He'll deliver you 100 files, unreviewed, no tests, and say, there, it's done, I did it. And then after the fact, when you say, well, this, is, this doesn't do me any good, I can't review this, There's no, I don't know if it's working or not, he says, well, he tries to negotiate the success conditions after the fact. He says, well, you should have told me I needed tests. You should have known, told me it had to be reviewed. You should, it's not my fault, it's your fault. And then finally, and this is the thing that really drives me nuts, he games the rules of the organization. Whatever policy is in place, whether it's informal or, or, or whether it's formal or informal, problem child will look at it and obey to the letter of the law what is going on, but with the outcome, with an outcome that is the exact opposite of the intent of the policy in the first place, so long as it benefits problem child. I've seen this over and over again, and because they do so well in the organization in terms of, in terms of making customers happy, management says, you know, you know what, we're gonna, let it, we're gonna let it go this time, and this time, and this time, over and over again, it becomes very demoralizing for everyone else to see problem child getting away with stuff that they themselves can't ever, could never get away with. Classic example, again, cheated on his final, Kobayashi Maru, classic problem child. But here's the thing, if you have a problem child in your organization and you're their manager, the first thing you need to recognize about problem child is that they thrive on responsibility. They want their greatness recognized by you. If only everyone could see how awesome I am, they'd stop hassling me so much. So there are two things you can do with problem child that will help uh, uh, solve that for them. The first thing is, if you can give them independent work where they can go off and do their own thing, perhaps even be responsible directly to the customer instead of responsible to you as the manager, do that. They love that kind of thing. They want to see themselves as their own boss and not responding to, and not having to answer to anybody else. So if you can get away with that, that's a good use for problem child. But here's the interesting thing. Problem child very often does work really well in a team, but only if they're leading it. So if you can find your way clear and you don't feel yourself bristling too much, feeling like it's rewarding them for bad behavior, let them pick out a team. But this is the key, let them pick it out. Let them try to find people who will actually work with them. This may actually be problem child's first failure. If no one wants to work with them, problem child has no one to blame but themselves. If they do end up picking a team, and the team works with them, and then you're now delivering product, you also have to remember that, as with Lawrence of Arabia, problem child can be a sword that cuts both ways. It may start out working well, but when it starts going badly, problem child may revert to old habits and start blaming everyone else but themselves, in which case it's going to hurt you. So you still need to manage that very closely if you let them pick out their own team. In any case, if problem child ends up not doing well in the independent work and not doing well as a team lead, what does that leave you with? I mean, I hate to say it, there's really no option. You can't keep them on. They're gonna destroy the, the, product, the, the productivity and the morale of the, rest of the rest of the organization. You have to let them go. And that's always a tough call, but it's the right thing, but it, it'll probably be the right thing to do. Again, this one doesn't exactly fit, but it's too good to leave out. Captain Kirk, I'm sorry, I can't hear you over the sound of how awesome, awesome I am. Problem child. Now it worked out for him, worked out for Starfleet, but it could have gone badly. An organizational structure, and I hesitate to call it a structure, when the name unstructured meritocracy is in here. There is a paper called The Tyranny of Structurelessness. Who here has read this paper before? A Couple of people. This is written by a woman named Joe Freeman. I'm gonna say something that's controversial, but I'm saying it for a reason. I am not a leftist, I am not a progressive. So when I tell you to read a paper by a leftist, progressive, feminist, you had better believe it is an outstanding paper. It is fantastic. 
Joe Freeman, very heavily involved in the feminist movement of the late 60s, early 70s, wrote a paper about her experiences there, specifically the transition from unstructured rap groups, where people would get together and just do consciousness raising, and the transition from that over to groups with some intended action or outcome as a result. What she discovered was that the unstructured group style of the rap groups did not translate well at all into a sort of meritocratic organization where they specifically wanted to eschew the ideas of patriarchal hierarchy. What we're going to do is we're going to have in this group that we're, we're trying to perform some work, we're going to let the people who do the work make the decisions, and on that merit become the group leaders. Which sounds fantastic, right? Except it doesn't actually work out that way. As Orwell told us from Animal Farm, and as people discovered under Stalin, all animals might be equal, but some are more equal than others. So what happened in those groups was, it turned out that there was a hierarchy. There was a, uh, an, an elite section, even though everyone said that everyone, even though we said we we're all gonna be equal to each other. It turned out that that informal hierarchy, that implicit hierarchy, was based on the social organization, the friendships between the people in the group, and not on their nominal belonging to the group in the first place. So what Joe Freeman discovered was that there really was an in-group, it was just implicit, not explicit. And it was based on friendships, because the people who were actually running the groups that she belonged to went and had lunches with each other that she was not part of. They went into other social engagements and talked about and made decisions in those social engagements, not in the group setting, and then came back to the group and dictated to the group what was going to happen. There's always, in short, there's always an in-group, and if you're not part of the in-group, you're part of the out-group. So if you discover that you are in a group of this type that calls itself egalitarian, meritocratic, again, I'm not against meritocracy, but if it's calling itself meritocracy, but merit is not defined, then you have a problem. You need to figure out what is meritorious and then do that. And if you're doing those things and it's not working for you, you need to begin by recognizing that there is in fact a hierarchy here and you are probably low in it. Recognize what that hierarchy is first thing. Identify what the social interactions are between the people that are in the group, this quote unquote unstructured group. And once you find out what those social interactions are, you will begin to discover what the actual hierarchy is because it does actually exist. And then once you've found that out, decide if you like where you are. Do I enjoy being in this when I know that either I am part of the in-group or I know that I am part of the out-group? Whichever, whichever that ends up being, whether you like it or not like it, that's fine. If you like it, great, stick around. If you don't like where you are, you can leave or you can try to work yourself up in it but in doing so, don't commit to technical strategies because technical strategies are not gonna help you here. What you need to do are commit to social strategies. Start going to lunch with them, become friends with them. And if you can't do that, then you're probably not going to rise in that hierarchy. So we talked about the evil ruler and their chief enforcer in, in movies. We do have an evil ruler over us at work. It is time. Everything is about time weighing on you. How much time will it take to finish this feature? How much time do we have left on the, on, the, uh, on the contract? How much time do we have left in the schedule to do all the things we need to do? Who has read The Mythical Man Month by Fred Brooks? Not enough. I read this book as part of my capstone class for my information systems degree. It is fantastic. If you read this one book, The Mythical Man Month, you will know more about project management than any other three project managers you've met in your life. Guaranteed. Fred Brooks wrote this book in 19, is it 74 or 75? Let's say it was 74. He wrote this book in 1974 about a project at IBM that he finished in 1964. Everything he wrote is still true today. Every single word. In the main essay of this book, he states something, he states something that is now called Brooks' Law, I'll read it out loud to you in a minute because it's important for you to actually hear it said to you. But before I do, if you have a software project running late, how many of you have been in an organization where they tried to add developers to the late project to make it go faster? 
almost everybody. How'd that work out? Busted. The reason is because, this is Brooks' law, adding manpower to a late software project makes it later. It doesn't make it faster, it makes it slower. And he explains why in this essay, I will give a brief overview of two reasons from this essay why that is true. The first reason is, let's say you've got five developers and you add five more. The five more are now new on the project. Where are they going to get their information about the project? From the first five developers. What are those first five developers doing instead of programming? They're training the new, for the new five developers. So you, what you think you've done is you've doubled your, doubled your capacity. What you've done is dropped it to zero. Because while the old developers are training the new ones, the old developers are getting nothing done. The new ones are getting nothing done just by definition. That's one reason. Second reason is you have now increased the number of communication links as you add people to the project. If you have one developer, there's no communication link. So if you have two, there's one communication link between them. If you have five developers, there's 10 communication links between them. If you have 10 developers, there are 45. It increases exponentially as you add manpower linearly. The communication costs at some point overwhelm the productive capacity of the team. That's in addition to it changing the nature of the team in the first place. Managing 10 developers is very different from managing five. So again, adding manpower to a late software project makes it more late. And then when you realize you're late, management starts saying, well, we need to work fast, we need to... People under, this is Lister, people under time pressure do not think faster. It's not like you were thinking at 50% speed before and now, we, now we're really serious, we can think at 100% speed. It just doesn't work that way. And even when you take those things into account, there's a guy named Douglas Hofstadter who has some bad news for us. This is from a book called Goodell Escher Bach, The Eternal Golden Braid, which I started reading 20 years ago and have not finished. <laughs> it always takes longer than you expect it will, even when you take Hofstadter's law into account. It's recursive. So no matter what you think you're going to do, it's always going to take longer. And the way you know it's taking longer than it should is because of Hartree, when the time from now until completion of the project tends to remain constant. Let's say you start a three-month project. One month into the project, you're like, oh yeah, we, we misestimated. It's actually gonna be another three months. Four months into the project, you're like, oh, well, okay. I know we're a little late, but another three months will be done. A year into the project, another three months will be done. The time to completion is remaining constant. Time to step back and reevaluate where you are. When you do this reevaluation of where you are, and you're trying to handle this pressure of the schedule that the time is dictating to you, there's really not a lot you can do. All of these are from, uh, all of these are from Brooks. You could, of course, extend the deadline. And extending the deadline is when I say free, I mean free in terms of time. It should be relatively easy to go to the bosses and say, you know what, we think it's gonna be another six months, we need the deadline extended. And they say, okay, it's six months. You know, maybe, there's, maybe that, that particular schedule is not that big a deal. So that's free in terms of time. You can make that decision relatively quickly. The other thing you can do, of course, is reduce scope. You can say, well, we can deliver it, we can deliver something on the date we promised, but we can't deliver all of those things. Okay, which things are you not gonna deliver? We're gonna reduce the scope. This, is, this sounds easy, but it's not. Because what do you have to do? Who, what are you gonna reduce? What are you gonna get rid of? You're gonna have to have meetings about that. Every week of meetings, where we're deciding on what to, how to reduce the scope, is a week of non-productivity. So this is not free. And I guarantee you, when you reduce the scope, you're only gonna reduce things, right? The first things you're gonna think of, well, this'll take a day, that'll take, these are minor things. We can get rid of these minor things. So you've now spent a week to get rid of things that are only gonna take you two days to produce in the first place. You need to cut big stuff when you do this. You need to kill your darlings. And no one's gonna be happy about that, but it's gonna be the only way to make the deadline if the deadline is that important. Now there's another one, this is also from Brooks. You can parallelize independent tasks. The idea is, in any project, there are some things that can be sidelined and done by an independent team without reference to anything else. 
If you can figure out what those things are, you can actually add manpower. Have them do this independent thing because there is no communication necessary between them and, the main, say, the main thrust of development. You can actually bring on a new team, spin them up, and have them do that. Then you avoid the mythical man month problem. Then you avoid the communication cost problem. But even that is not free because you need to figure out what the parallelizable tasks are. That's going to mean your developer sitting down, figuring out which parts can be separated out. Every week of, of working through that is a week of non-productivity and you're one week closer to your deadline. So that's not free either. And even with all of that in mind, we need to remember the Love Putnam Law, which says there is a maximum amount of schedule compressibility. There is a barrier beyond which you cannot reduce the schedule. It has been my experience that that barrier is somewhere around 25%. That if you're not going to, if you're not going to if even after you reduce the scope, even by a little bit, and you add some manpower for parallelizable tasks, you might get a four-month project down to three. You might get a 12-month project down to, what would it be, nine? But not much more than that. Now, that is my experience only. You may have different experience. We have the evil ruler of time. Who's his enforcer? Everybody. Your boss, the project manager, the product owner, the team lead, the customers, you yourself. You feel the weight of this time and you want to enforce it against yourself. This is something you need to recognize on your own so that you don't kill yourself trying to meet deadlines that cannot be reasonably met. Your first duty is to your own sanity. So with all that in mind, I hope that I have convinced you by talking about the patterns in movies and the same characters and experiences we see there, also from mythology, that these patterns also exist. There are other patterns at work that we, that if we could recognize them, we would know how to deal with them better. The priest and merchant archetypes, the problem child, the problem of structurelessness and informal hierarchies that you can't necessarily see. Time as the evil ruler and ourselves in lots of ways as the evil ruler's enforcer. I tell you all this stuff, again, in terms of entertainment, so you can delight in recognition, but in terms of work, so that when you see these things happening, you can get in front of them. Because if you can recognize them and deal with them effectively, your work life will be that much better. And I hope that by giving you the knowledge of how to recognize these, that this presentation has been a gift of assistance. To you, the hero in your own story, from me, an old man who hopefully has been a mentor. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Are we doing questions and answers for this? Or I'm perfectly happy. Questions, comments about any of this? I have a comment. I want to thank you for your service. Oh, thank you very much for saying. Other questions? Yes. Uh, just a comment. Uh, have you seen The Writer's Journey by Chris Wagner? Have I seen The Writer's Journey by Wagner? I have not. Uh, it takes, uh, it explicitly connects Joseph Campbell's theories to <coughs> the film industry. And it's, uh, it's fantastic as a summary of the mythology. I have not seen that. I'll have to. Uh, what is it again? The Writer's, the writer's Journey. The Writer's Journey by Wagner connecting. Uh, Hollywood stories specifically to Campbell. I, I actually, you say that, I do remember that Lucas uh, quotes Campbell a lot as his own inspiration for the Star, for at least for the first Star Wars movie. Other questions or comments? All right, thank you very much. I hope everyone enjoys the conference.